Hi everybody, I'm Bethlyn Eicher and I'm excited to talk to you about high performance computing and evaluating and planning. It's a system that I call HEAP from my company, Architect. I hope that some of you have some experience in high performance computing. If not, I'll, I'm excited to talk to you about large scale environments that may benefit from these security strategies. We are at Boston University, so I have to throw in there the photo of me next to Race Murray Hopper system that is currently showcased at Harvard. This is not the um, high performance computing system where she discovered the first bug, but this is one of her many, many various beautiful machines that she had built over a span of um, a career of over 50 years. I am honored to be um, walking on the shoulders of such giants. I myself come from a background of over 20 years experience in um, playing with things like Linux and in fact it was the high performance computing market that brought me to the free software culture and specifically the Red Hat ecosystem with an internship at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center whenever I was an undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh. Today I I am a high performance computing consultant. I am definitely available for the, the next project, so please let's have that kind of conversation. I am here and most eager to help you and your organization. Well, I think I'm the first non Red Hat employee to, to speak up here. I um, somebody who is enabled to resell Red Hat software. So I happen to have customers that use RHEL, whether it be for their high performance computing or other infrastructure needs. But what I've come to find out is there are um, quite honestly a majority market share folks using CentOS technologies, and that's why I'm excited to talk to you here today. So why does CentOS matter so much in high performance computing? If somebody has the money to buy a high performance computing cluster, why wouldn't they go straight to RHEL? Well, actually, it's because they've invested so much in infrastructure like the data center in which to host such a large machine and its power and its cooling and its networking back to campus or your other corporate environment. They also have the user community that is driving their demand for such specialized resources such as GPUs in memory that certainly are not cheap for those particular pieces of hardware. Moreover, high performance computing has been traditionally clocked by the gigaflops that it can compute over a time spirit period. However, that's becoming less and less relevant today when we talk about high performance computing, whether it be 
for business applications such as AI, like we had a previous presenter discuss here, or perhaps you have uh, an environment where you happen to have large amounts of data to parse. And those are the, the most critical scientific problems that are facing the, this world as a human race. They're looking at the genome for us all, and this is how we plan to cure cancer, everybody, with high-performance computing. So when there's the discussion of do we buy a round of rel entitlements or do we go with CentOS, it's more often than not CentOS. However, there are some customers who feel more comfortable within the rel support or perhaps they happen to have a site license for other reasons and decide to use RHEL. Every cluster is different, though. I have um, gotten into conversations with people at universities and corporations and um, government research labs and you happen to have one particular core component that you always see within your HPC environment. That is, you need compute nodes. That's where the jobs will run. You'll need a scheduler. That is a piece of software that runs on top of your cluster to make sure that the jobs get filled in to the cluster. And you'll need a head node that is a gateway, usually an interface via SSH, that will uh, permit your users from um, directly logging into any one unit of the cluster. Trust me, you do not want that. That's absolute madness. Instead, you will typically give them the SSH credentials for one system, and you talk to the cluster scheduler to negotiate the, your resources, such as how many CPUs, how much memory, what kind of CPU, maybe you want a GPU, and how much time. There is a new innovation within the world of how one accesses an HPC, which is uh, the innovation of the web-based job scheduling. And these resources sometimes come from industry, but quite often come from academia such as Ohio Supercomputing Center with On Demand or Penn State University with Galaxy. Regardless of how you access the cluster with an SSH or with a web portal, you may want to investigate if you want to use a VPN in which to tunnel into this infrastructure or not. I've worked on systems where it was absolutely no network comes in to the lab. That's a very typical in an environment where it's government classified, where the only way that you are going to gain access to the HPC is if you walk in through the gate, show your credentials, sit down at your desk, and then authenticate to the high-performance computing cluster. That is one um, security strategy, such as um, making sure that you are behind uh, a air-gapped network environment.
But for the rest of us, and I'm seeing this even more increasing, that you've got government to university collaborations, university to corporate collaborations, you have government to corporate collaborations, and all, all combinations in between. And how is it that you're going to manage things like multi-domain authentications and uh, users who are logging in from multiple sites and maintain some level of security posture policy or um, mandated compliance. That's where HEAP comes in. High Performance Computing Evaluating Plan is specifically for the study of each and every cluster and how it wor and works with its ingress, egress. It's um, compute, it's data at risk, and other infrastructure areas to match it up with the National Institute of Standards and Technology 853A family of controls. Then it's only with a holistic approach that you can take a look at your overall computing infrastructure and examine and actually have a conversation as to how you are operating with your security posture corporate-wide and between your collaborators. Um, what I often hear is um, compliance. Ew, yucky, who wants to get involved with that? Some folks decide to um, use uh, security checklists that they've adopted internally to um, make sure that the operating systems of their high performance computing compute engines are within a certain guideline. However, it, it does not take into consideration the entire ecosystem that is high performance computing because you've got the problem of not only the, the storage once you got it, get it in there but it's the, the data coming in and the data coming out and these are the crown jewels of what makes research happen within high performance computing environments. And these are the innovations that not only will save us as a human race, but will also um, do other cool things like um, allow us to, to go to Mars. NASA is one big user of high performance computing and what they use as a standard is 853A because they are a federal system and organization. You might think, well, I'm a small research university. Uh, I don't think that 853A is right for us in our organization. Oh, really? Have you used um, any federal money in which to procure that cluster? Because the exact guidelines about how these clusters are to be procured are laid out in 853A. And not its um, smaller counterpart, 171. You might also consider 
maybe you're not collaborating now, but you might want to collaborate down the road. Or maybe you are a pharmaceutical company who actually does research internally on human subjects. You're involved with healthcare all of a sudden, and you need to have a greater level of controls as to what it is that you are doing to operate your high performance computing system. So 853A might be best for you. However, if you continue to insist, nope, I'm not doing a, anything unclassified, nope, I'm never going to collaborate with the federal government, nope, I'm doing nothing with healthcare, no, I uh, have bought this cluster on my own money, thank you, I've never needed the United States government for anything and our research is completely private here then okay i'm happy for you that you can get by with 171 even so it's uh, quite a political balancing act to go through 75 pages with your organization to decide what policies are appropriate for your over and all environment. That's a lot of work. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the 853A or the 171 if you really prefer and help you sift through the pages as a professional service. We'll um, break down the conversation of what you are doing with your high performance computing in real human language so that you can actually bureaucratically get through this and then decide as you go through the four, over 470 pages of the guide and discover what's right for you because I actually have visited the National Institutes in Standard Technology and met some of the authors who have told us, guess what, folks, we never intended you to use the entire thing. It's a catalog. A catalog means you go shopping through it and you decide what is appropriate for your environment. And some things are just not going to be appropriate for your environment and, and other things you're going to want to park to circle back to later. And while it, this is sorting through documentation, you have to document what your, your workflow and for things that you wanted to circle back to later. This is a lot of work. This is why I would advise you to get involved a High performance computing, cybersecurity experts such as myself to guide you in this conversation. Some folks may um, go into the uh, discussion of policy and say, okay, fine, we have a policy, that's great but how is it that the system administrators are going to actually implement the high performance computing policy that you have just come along to discuss? It would be a shame to go through that sort of exercise because I have heard it can and typically does take about two years of time and not actually put any technical controls around it. Within a, an environment where somebody just continues to say, okay, Red Hat, I will we'll continue to give you my money, I don't care how much it costs, then those customers can continue to buy REL entitlements and they can buy Red Hat satellite and they can buy the um, Red Hat administration 
for Active Directory. However, if you are a CentOS site, you do not have access to satellite. Fortunately, the projects that are part of satellite are freely available to you and very usable within the CentOS environment. Furthermore, you certainly have the ability to use free IPA to sit on top of whatever directory you have deployed within your corporation or within your partners or perhaps you deployed an open LDAP specifically for your cluster to um, aggregate all of the authentication in authorization and access controls for your entire organization. That's really important because I've seen sites keep a completely separate open LDAP and then when somebody leaves it's not necessarily that speedy of a communication to disconnect <coughs> their access to the cluster and or limit their access if they happen to move elsewhere within the organization. Everybody, uh, what, regardless if they have access to Red Hat Satellite or Red Hat Satellite upstream components, should be using OpenSCAP, which is an automated way to verify that you are actually utilizing the operation system specific controls that you had agreed to within your policies. You're going to also need some form of configuration management. You can use Ansible, Puppets, Chef, Salt, what have you. Just do it. Please don't use uh, a bunch of bash scripts that were homegrewed internally. I'm seeing that still a lot in HPC to this day. Um, hopefully within a generation that will turn around, but um, I suppose some configuration management is better than nothing. But due to the fact that we, we do have a good suite of configuration management tools available to us as CentOS users, why would we do anything different? I recommend the use of Coledo if you do not have access to Red Hat Satellite for um, the remediation of applying RPMs that are not up to date. Now there are a lot of reasons within high performance computing that you may not want to configure automatic updates for your repositories. Perhaps you have a custom kernel specifically for your high-speed networking that you do not want to be disturbed with a random kernel update. Well, here you can visualize the decisions that you had made as a organization to specifically not or delay certain updates until an appropriate time. And Foreman is one of those um, satellite upstream products that will allow you to inventory all of your CentOS systems, whether they be on premise or in the cloud, you'll know exactly what it is that you have 
I'll say it again. You can inventory in the cloud that I am seeing folks taking the, the on-premise compute or that they have and bursting to AWS. If they have absolutely no idea what's floating out there, that could be problematic. I would also advise them to invest in gig Red Hat platforms, but I, at least utilizing Foreman for inventory discovery is a really solid start. So once you go and you um, inventory, limit, monitor, recover, it's a constant cycle. You keep going round and round, round and round, round and round, because security is a constant, ever-flowing process, and you have to keep on top of it, or else you're, you're just going to have an incident, and you do not want to pay for an incident. So let's talk about your HPC. Who has an HPC in here? Oh wow, we have four in the house have a, a, an HPC. So are you all administered or do you just have access to it? Uh, administer. I administer like the development environment so I client support the team and across the hall as it's. Okay. Who else? Okay. Well, um, the, this discussion is exactly for you. So how is it that you allow your users to connect to the high performance computing system? Is everybody direct SSHing in? No? You're direct SSHing in? Yeah, we SSH in the head nodes and we SSH in the other nodes and we have a remote desktop via X to go that uses SSH in the bit also. Okay. Is anybody using web portals yet? You are? Yep. All right, what web portal are you using? Uh, we've got one that we developed. Oh, you developed one in house. Yep. Okay. Well, um,. That's an interesting part about HPC is that a lot of these tools are just so unique to the workload of managing a unique system that you have in-house developed software and who's going to manage the security controls of that. Something that you should consider as you um, examine how it, it works with your overall security policy that you agreed upon for an overall organization. I've seen it done well actually where um, someone becomes an, a subject matter expert in its um, the care and feeding of an in-house developed code and there needs to be lots and lots and lots of documentation and cross-training regarding that particular piece of software within high performance computing or, or else you're going to have problems if somebody needs to go on a sabbatical. Um, is anybody at VPNing? in first before you permit SSH. For certain resources? For certain resources, but not for everything. Correct. Okay, so you might have a lot of smaller clusters. It's more complicated than that. Um, but a bigger cluster to rule them all, it sounds like. <coughs> um, there are logging nodes with direct access to certain data um, and those are those require VPN. Um, if you SSH to one of the login nodes that do not have direct access to it, you can get at those resources, but that's considered to be a jump point where there's authentication. Uh, we also
also have the ability to do two factor with SSH in some cases, so that's possible. Yes, um, two-factor authentication I, I highly, highly recommend, especially if you are not utilizing a VPN, because what I've seen more often than not in academia is that the principal investigator will get an account for the high-performance computing and then share it with their research assistants, the credentials, and then you do not have proper metrics as to who is utilizing the cluster and even if you don't care about that sort of thing for your security you certainly care about that for your overall metrics as to how you your cluster is being utilized because if you do not document how your cluster is being utilized the next time you ask for funding within your institution, you're not going to get it. Everybody wants to see the numbers as to why you need a new high performance computing system. And even if you do have metrics, it might be pushed back on, well, this person happens to be using 80% of the resources. How is it possible that one person is using 80% of the resources? It, happens, folks. So let's talk about files. How is it that you share files on your cluster? Yes? To get files to the cluster in the first place, you mean? Yeah. Uh, we, we have a, a, a very intelligent wrapper around rsync or SFTP slash SCP. Um, it's actually like dot code dot and called GCD. Okay. It's, copy program. it's supposed to figure out the best way to copy it and copy it. Okay. All right. And um, so I, I hope that you have a data ingress node that handles this um, this data sync. So, I mean, first of all, this is within the, you know, this is one site to another, it's still, it's not like, not like we're doing over here in Anthony now. The HBC resources are off sites. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I completely understand. So you are doing um, data replication across two sites where you, you are syncing. Well, um, perhaps you may want to take a look at Ceph, for example, for uh, potentially leveraging their geo replication. It's not so much replication as you know the scientists plus developers plus users purposely want to send the data over. They know they want to send it over. Oh, so you you need it to be um, a selective push. Yeah, the, the users you know, decide what they want to push and what they want to pull back. Sounds like a neat project. I, I hope that you commit it somewhere. Oh, fantastic. Definitely point it out to me. I'm, I'm very fascinated by it. Anybody else want to talk about how files get in, how files get out? Globus. Globus, yes. Globus is definitely of interest to me, and I am in conversation with those folks. It's definitely because I happen to be from Chicago and I have a good working relationship with the folks at the University of Chicago. Our GCP program also uses Globus on the back ends. Okay, yeah, that, that's a fabulous way to go about it because it is um, distributing the, the workload of the, the file transfer rather than just a single SCP stream. That, that's a good way to handle it. We're at Boston University. Anybody using OpenAFS anymore? That's how I, I got files into my high performance computing system 19 years ago. It is still a valid way for 
universities and the Department of Energy to continue to, to share data amongst each other. I've learned about something new called a science gateway, which is distinct from the science DMZ. But the science gateway is an opportunity for a data set or an open source project to say, hey, we can't guarantee that we're still going to be around 10 years from now because we're an academically fun project. So I, we want to make sure that the, do, that the idea is well documented and centralized places put out there for hosting just in case we happen to disappear so that somebody else can pick up on our idea. There's that pathway. And then there's the science DMZ where there are um, specialized nodes that are set up for multi-institution collaborations to make sure that the access controls are appropriate within uh, that particular environment. It, it's a very cool thing. Let's talk about um, when your users leave. What happens to their files? It's very industry dependent. So if you happen to be in commercial oil and gas, you need to retain those records practically forever of where you were doing for resource discovery. But other industries, you may need to um, delete upon disconnect. There are some web portals such as the Galaxy web portal from Penn State University, which enables anonymous logins to a cluster if properly configured. With those types of files, you definitely don't want anonymous files creeping around on your cluster continue to take up your glorious resources of your storage. So you may need to delete upon disconnect. But I'm seeing a lot in, in research universities that somebody's gone, but not really gone, that they'll move on to another university, but they'll keep their files there just in case. Well, with that just in case, I understand the ins and outs of intellectual property offices within universities, but you need to also have some facilities to handle the access controls, and that is where a solution like Free IPA would really come in and help you work through that sort of issue. So these are the types of human level of questions that architect can help you break it down to make appropriate decisions regarding what part of 853A is appropriate for you right now and what may be appropriate for you in the future. This project is quite honestly a work in progress. We hope to have this funded with a small business innovation research grant with either the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy. We are going to need some serious allies to be able to pull off even the overwhelming task of getting funded. I'm going to need people from industry who have high performance computing resources who will volunteer to have a conversation with me about their security posture and how we can apply these tools to their environment so that we can assess a fair market value for not only the conversation value 
that these consulting services provide, but also the incidental conversations that may be profitable, such as the resale of hardware or software that may come as a decision whenever the, the new procurement process or perhaps a existing high performance computing system to, to bring it, it up to spec. I'm going to need major universities and small universities to help me demonstrate that this is possible to be utilized for big clusters such as ones on top 500 and small clusters meaning oh we've got a modest rack sitting over there in somebody's lab it's not even in the machine room sort of level and modest my goal is that all sites would be able to utilize heap i also need government institutions to be able to say back to their small business innovation research program hey look you you should consider funding architect because i think that this is an interesting project that we may need to use within the government for government use. The 853A was designed for government use and will continue to be designed for government use, so it would make sense that the government would also want to use this as a product for um, our, their overall security posture to get an outside opinion from industry that I found between government and between the um, university culture that there are institutions where people happen to stay for their entire career and well that, that definitely brings great innovation to have that type of stability within an institution. What that, that lacks is the, the knowledge of what's new and, and what's out there. And I congratulate the four system administrators of HPC Resources being here today to examine what the CentOS community is doing and is and encourage you to stay throughout the weekend as we see what the greater development community within free software <coughs> is doing because keeping in on top of in innovation and networking and sharing ideas is what is going to build a more collaborative research space for all of us, whether we be from commercial, government, or academia, because we are one moral force, and we gotta cure cancer. That's my presentation. Does anybody have any general questions on high performance computing? And it's cybersecurity. Does uh, Architect have any? Uh, does Architect have any uh, public resources on any public gifts or anything like that? That I uh, am definitely on the ground floor of that. So what I'm going to start doing is to put out just general documentation, starting with this slide deck and other materials that I recently put out there at similar conferences to encourage folks to get more involved. But I, it's um, an overall integration of 
a lot of existing software, that we're not writing a lot of new software. What may come into mind whenever I'm thinking about new software that would come out of this research is commits back to open SCAP content, which we would commit upstream to not only open SCAP as a RICAT sponsored project, but SCAP at NIST, which is um, a not open source, but public domain repository of uh, these types of automated controls. But it is extremely important to us that these um, content be not only open SCAP compatible, but compatible with CentOS and RHEL. So, um, my understanding is that OpenSCAP uh, tests for the, you know, uh, you applying security controls, but mm -hmm. does not, and you're actually using it, but we are, you know, for in terms of like detecting vulnerabilities, such as unpatched software, we reliant on, you know, currently a, like a government mandated uh, Nessus, you know, proprietary vulnerability scanner. Do you have, what's your like approach to scanning for vulnerabilities like that? Well, if it's red, had package management based, then Kaleido is definitely the way to go. If it is software that you install, then um, from source, which happens all the time in HPC or um, definitely performance reasons, then I would advise utilizing some modern piece of configuration management software for you to, um, to keep on top of that. Moreover, <laughs> I would advise the, um, you to look into how containers can be used to enforce security within open SCAP. So a, perhaps it is a scenario where you have a lot of common pieces of software within one environment and you can run your um, open SCAP across your container. It doesn't have to be a bare metal. Gotcha. Um, I also just want to mention one thing. Free IPA is originally stood for, I think, identity policy and audit. Mm -hmm. And they sort of deferred the audit functionality, but they seem to be working more on that now. Like, there's, they're working on uh, user session recordings, such as, oh, this person became admin, what are they doing with admin rights? So okay. In the long run, that'd be, that could help you with some of these controls, too. Yes, yes, that's very powerful. Thank you. It's too early to ask you about this, but uh, as HPC helps to resolve real world problems in healthcare industries and others, there's similarly a uh, you know, growing industry, but it's under research that is quantum computing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know that uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, Red Hat partnership or with this thing, server solution, but as it is going to be a potential industry which will help to resolve the real world problems. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any consideration maybe in future where uh, Architect will, uh, in, uh, will increase its scope of service? Uh, any of your thoughts for that as it will be to resolving similar problems in future? Well, well yes, that, that's a very good question. That it, it's not just Red Hat, which we are partnered with. We are partnered with many of the hardware vendors specifically for that reason, that we want to be within the loop of the conversation of, 
hey, um, somebody is actually making a go at quantum computing for some real world, not just theoretical problem solving. And that is a conversation that we'd be really thrilled to have because it's within the, the bleeding edge or the even the home brewed systems that you might have some um, security controls to deal with. There, I'll give you a good example. Um, this is not an American system. Number two is a Chinese system that was completely constructed with non-Intel hardware and with a Linux distribution that they built themselves. And because it's Chinese classified, we would have no idea as to what it actually is other than what they have told us with reporting back to top 500 with their clocks. But what we know is from how they utilized their, um, their clock speed uh, that it's definitely a Linux variant and it's definitely ranks at top two in, in the world. So we, as an industry, have experience in examining weird and new platforms and how the, the security implications of those new platforms might evolve. One that we might see perhaps more frequently is the open power platform from IBM, which does not use Intel chips either. Of course, distinct from the very very, very different possibility of quantum computing. But yes, I, I am aware that it, it's something that it will happen. Yeah. Just can't tell you when. Maybe you can tell me when. I can't tell you when. <laughs> uh, we, we will try to answer that in our talk, maybe. OK. But uh, have you ever been, uh, have been any in touch or conversation with any of the organizations like IBM or eBay or any of the university involved in it? Um, we're partnered with IBM, so well, I've talked more uh, with them about open power, mm -hmm. and every single time I bring up quantum computing, they say, oh, well, that's another team, as <laughs> IBMers will do, and the, no, I don't know anybody over there. So if you could do an introduction, that would be spectacular. Well, I was kind of hoping you could help us to have an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can try. We can try together. That, that would actually be better, because if I come to IBM yeah. with a customer, then it's all of a sudden more relative to them than if I'm just asking as a partner with just a, a hypothetical opportunity. Thank you, Beth Lynn. Fantastic. I'll have a um, hand out sheet to send around and as well as a little bit of a sign up list if you would like to be involved in this conversation. I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you.